steward of everyone's time who's already here. Um, so we want to welcome you uh, to today's panel and hopefully, you know, you all had an opportunity to see some of the information that's been available on the CS for Georgia Summit website, um, the everything from the bio information to even just the, the description about this conversation that you're about to be a part of. Um, so this is a conversation, right, that is going to delve into uh, the impacts, uh, the current status, and what still needs to be done relative to young women in, uh, in, in technology, in computer science specifically. When we think about, you know, there was this tremendous uptick that was happening between uh, 2007, 2014, in, term, in terms of the number of young girls that were interested in pursuing computer science, that were pursuing computer science in college. And then in 2014, uh, reports reflect a downturn that happened relative to, you know, statistically, the number of young girls that were engaging in computer science. And we're trying to rebound from that. Um, and, and, and clearly what, we've hit another recession. Um, we've hit obviously, the dynamic impact of COVID, the heightened awareness around racial inequity um, that exists still in our country, and all of that absolutely uh, impacts the young women who decide to pursue careers in a space where, they where they still don't traditionally see themselves. So this is a great conversation for women who will have the opportunity to share out with you both from a corporate com corporate commit perspective, a community partner perspective, what it means to be engaged, to have an impact, um, what you can do. So you will absolutely hear calls to action in this conversation. And we again, we look forward to the dialogue with you. So uh, we want to start just by allowing um, our panelists that are here and give them an opportunity to introduce, take a couple of minutes to introduce themselves. Again, you'll get their more extended bio and all the links that are available in so many places. We won't continue to repeat everywhere where you can find uh, you can find their 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 information. But please go out and do that, right? So we're going to start with Peter Gay. Let's start with you, please, with just a couple of minutes of introducing yourself to the audience. Yeah, sure, no problem. Thank you, Erica. My name is Peter Gay Clark. I'm a diversity manager at Google. I lead the Code Next program. Um, I've been a software engineer for a number of years. And um, in coming to Google, I transitioned into being a diversity manager. Prior to that, I um, also uh, launched and led, co led the New York chapter of Black Girls Code. It was a volunteer capacity, just something that I was really passionate about. Um, and now I'm, I'm doing this uh, exact work at Google. Thank you so much. We're so excited to have you here. So Amanda, please, a couple of minutes to introduce yourself to today's participants. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Amanda Souza, and I work for Girls Who Code as a community partnership manager. Uh, I specifically support 15 states across the nation and have the pleasure of working with Georgia and a few of the school districts I see represented here today. So we do work with Gwinnett, DeKalb, uh, Clayton, Cobb, Douglas, Fulton as community partner uh, school districts. My background is in teaching fourth grade. And so I had the pleasure of doing coding skills with my fourth graders. And I've also worked in operations at a few other educational nonprofits. Thanks so much, Amanda and Stacy. If you don't mind, a couple of minutes to introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Stacy Rivers. I am the Director of People Growth and Skills Strategy at Warner Media, and it's really a pleasure to be here today to talk about this subject. I grew up in the technology business unit, if you will, for Turner Broadcasting, um, where I am now in the HR uh, area focused on developing the tech skills strategy for all Warner Media employees, um, and specifically with a specialty for looking at our technologists and how we continue to engage them in emerging, uh, to develop their skills in emerging technology. 
I am also a PhD candidate um, at Mercer University in Educational Leadership. And my research focus is really this intersection of collaboration between industry and academia. I've, for the past several years, I've researched massive open online courses and looking at how we can use that model to infuse more diversity uh, from a corporate perspective on the industry side. Thanks so much, Stacy. Um, and I can't see Napia, so, uh, but Napia, if you're here, uh, please introduce, um, she may be transitioning. Uh, if not, uh, so, um, so Ko, I see your message regarding Napia. Um, and I may need some guidance on how to do that. Uh, if our, if our, our, our team member that's supporting this session uh, isn't in a position to do so. Um, and I'll just introduce myself real quick while we get this figured out because we absolutely need her to be here. Uh, she is the founder and CEO of The Next IT Girl. Um, so her uh, contribution to this conversation is absolutely critical because like we promised you, we have conversations coming from both the corporate aspect as well as the community aspect. And, uh, and she is representative of that. So we want her voice to be at the table and a part of this conversation. So uh, like I said, real quick, my name is Erica Moore. I serve as the inaugural executive director uh, for the National S um, STEM Funders Network. It's a collaborative network made of grant-making organizations representing foundations from the West Coast uh, to the East Coast, all very focused on STEM, but different aspects of STEM. So some relative to out-of-school or um, after-school programming, uh, some focused specifically on science, uh, some focused on very, you know, on very localized areas like Tulsa or New York, um, for example, or in the Oregon area. Um, some focused on innovation and being in help creating the next set of inventors. So I'm honored to serve in this capacity, although they've been around since 2012. Um, she, they, they, it's an organization, right, that's been around since 2012 came together from the, for the purposes of making a difference, mitigating the inequities that exist in STEM. But basically a little over a year ago, they made the decision that if they really wanted to have a focus on sustainability and longevity relative to their organization, that they needed to bring somebody on board as their executive director. So I am humbled and honored to serve in, in that capacity um, and, and honored to be here with, like I said, these amazing panelists who are gonna bring forth the funk, the knowledge, and just keeping it 100 for the dialogue that we all need to be a part of right now. So I um, wanna jump into our first question, right? Because again, uh, we do want to be good stewards of your time. And so for the for our panelists, um, for, for Peter Gay and for Stacy, right? So from a corporate standpoint, can you share from your, you know, from your view, from your vantage point, um, as industry leaders who are keeping a steady eye on the pipeline of talent that's coming through, what has been your viewpoint around the the impact of COVID? Um, that was right a very devastating period. Um, we've seen the numbers where it wasn't just blue collar, but white collar jobs that were lost last year. So when we look at kind of keeping the end in mind, which you represent, what's your viewpoint uh, for both of you? If you could just share a few moments and how you see that. Uh, Stacy, let's start with you. So it's very interesting you asked that question because as you know, before COVID, there were some challenges with creating a diverse pipeline into a lot of the technology roles we have in the organization. And, you know, as we know, that that exists for a lot of reasons, right? It's the culture, it's the leadership, it's, you know, the ability to not really build the type of partnerships with the community-based programs that we need to. And so there's a lot that goes into that. And so now, as you can imagine, you know, looking at a post-pandemic strategy, the, the, the ball has shifted, so to speak, or the target has moved because now 
there's all of these emerging technologies that companies want to invest in because they see the need to um, further advance in this area. And the gap still exists uh, with the current workforce that we have for where we were before. So it's a very interesting time to uh, understand kind of what the new needs of the businesses are, you know, what the skill sets that we have, uh, and then how do we make sure that we're uh, infusing diversity um, into that equation. And so from, from my perspective, I really feel like this is an opportunity to get it right. This is an opportunity to reset. This is an opportunity to reach out and partner with a lot of those organizations to really infuse the organization with those type of skills, not just the skills, but also the people that embody those skills that will help shape uh, you know, our path and our plan going into the future. And so I'm really excited to be in this role for Warner Media to help with that new vision that we're creating and diversity and, and inclusion. DEI is definitely something that's uh, a top level priority uh, for all of us. And so I'm, I'm really excited about what the opportunity, if I can say, that COVID has presented around making these much needed changes. Yeah, I think Stacy nailed it. Um, I, in my work at Google, I focus on pre-college and young young girls of color. And uh, you already know, prior to the pandemic, this was a challenge. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a girls who code, there wouldn't be a woman who code or a black girls code. And oftentimes when we have these crises, our girls are, have the greatest risk, right? And so I think across the board, there always needs to be an intentional targeted focus on these girls and looking at what's happening um, to our young girls in these communities, so for sure. Thank you both so much for that. And, and we're gonna take a step back, you know, now that we've kind of talked about our current present status, we want to take a step back and really make sure we, we spend time, right, talking about um, the backdrop of this. Uh, uh, we know in many ways, yes, COVID created challenges, but particularly in education, uh, COVID exacerbated existing challenges, right? Uh, it, it, it didn't have to create new stuff. There were already inequities that were there. Uh, there were already inhibitors that were there. And so the lack of access, uh, the, the, the decreased lack of opportunities, um, not being able to engage in person, um, all of those had an impact on our educational ecosystem. So we wanna take a step back and we wanna talk about what did things look like prior to COVID? And that's where Amanda and Napia are going to share their perspective about that. But before we do that, Napia, we're so glad you're here. Um, and everybody had a couple of minutes to introduce themselves. So we will not be remiss in making sure that you have the opportunity to do the same. So Napia, if you could introduce yourself and I wanna give you a couple of minutes to kind of think about that question and just kind of get situated in the space. And so we'll let Amanda answer the question itself first and then we'll come back to you on your answer. So Napia, please introduce yourself to today's participants. Hey, thank you. Um, sorry for my tidy tidiness. Who knew you could get lost in a web like that? Um, but hi, everybody. My name is Napia Nabuya. I'm the founder of The Next It Girl, which is a tech ed education nonprofit organization where we're educating, mentoring, advancing young African-American, Black, and girls of color to pursue technology careers. And I am also a IT engineer as well. Perfect. Well, we're really glad to have you, Napia. And um, just to answer that question about what challenges existed before the pandemic, I think that you know that the lack of universal access to computer science was a huge inhibitor for our girls. So we are seeing a large increase of states requiring K-12 computer science standards, Georgia being one of them. But just this lack of access in itself has been a huge barrier for girls. In addition, um, Girls Who Code has actually done a lot of research into what specifically is happening with girls' computer science education. And so we did a report with Accenture called Cracking the Gender Code. It's a really great quick article to read and to get more information. But in this study, we really realized that girls need special um, pieces of curriculum that are gonna show them that this is the way forward and that 
it is accessible for them. We need to make sure that um, the computer science education for girls is really including role models that reflect who they are and that it's also a supportive environment with their peers. A lot of computer science classrooms are male dominated, but when we find those few spaces where there are enough girls, girls feel supported by their female peers. So in general, I mean, Girls Who Code has done a tremendous job of providing free curriculum and resources. Our curriculum really reflects this research. So we do ensure there are women in tech spotlights so girls can see themselves in these careers moving forward. And we also just really make sure that the curriculum is supportive. A lot of computer science programs are competitive in nature, um, but really our program is aligned with supporting girls and having girls work together to collaborate and give each other feedback, which is just so powerful. Echoing what Amanda said, um, I agree with all of that. I think for us uh, as, as a nonprofit, it was definitely convincing um, was the hardest uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, a lot of education spaces or community organizations, um, technology is being talked about a lot, but they didn't see the overall big picture of why we were pushing it so hard until the pandemic started when everybody is now completely online, everything is, is technology driven. So I think that was the biggest thing um, being able to, to go before and in person and say, you know, girls need to be in technology spaces. They need to learn more um, outside of just coding. I think that was the biggest uh, hardship for us, just making, um, making it known that technology is not, just not software development. It's just not being a coder. But there are thousands, uh, thousands of other unfulfilled jobs in technology, more on the networking side, cybersecurity, database management, cloud computing. We want to be able to... Um, expose girls to all of those areas. So definitely convincing um, was, was that hardship for us. Um, now, no convincing at all. Everybody has, has realized the need for technology all across the board. Both, I mean, you know, for anyone who was here at the, at the top of the summit and had an opportunity to listen to Mr. Williams um, and just, his phenomenal breakdown of, of equities and the way that we dissect it and the ways to approach it and the ways to evaluate it. You know, everything, ladies, that you have talked about is from the standpoint, you know, for me, it gets back to this, this, this one bullet of equity and, 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 and the lack of equity that has existed um, in a space for so long and quite honestly still continues, right? When we look at the number of, so um, he also talked about intersectionality. So as, as a black female, when I think about it, I think about the number of black technology executives sitting at still only 6% or the number of black female technology executives barely sitting at 2%. Um, you know, those are very daunting numbers and all four of you are playing a role in making a difference in that, whether it's creating equity and the educational access that occurs like through your two organizations, Amanda and Napia, or whether it's through the hiring protocols and not just the hiring protocols, but the cultural impact that you're making, Stacy and Peter Gay, in your respective places, right? Um, but it takes the whole ecosystem to be a part of that process. So I would love for all four of you to weigh in on when we think about, you know, uh, education and community partnerships, when we think about uh, corporate engagement, when we think about private and public funding models, um, all of those play a role in the overall equation of, e of creating equity in this space for young women, not just right well, as they're studying and through their educational lineage, but we know one of the other chasms in the pipeline is those first one to eight years is where we lose a lot of STEM talent. Um, again, because people 
We don't see people that look like us. We are in very challenging work environments that don't promote equity. Um, uh, there aren't enough uh, active mentorships that are being made available, or even better sponsorships that are being made available. So I've rambled enough. Um, uh, now we need to ensure that everybody hears from the four of you. So again, um, so, so Peter Gay, let's start with you. Um, if you could just weigh in and again, this is one that we want all four of you to please share your thoughts. Yeah, for sure. I, I think speaking from the corporate social responsibility aspect, um, one of the things we had to do internally at Google is really educate our leaders. You know, you can't have a productive or fruitful conversation if we're not on, on the same page on what equity means. And sort of like the presentation earlier, like making sure everyone is grounded in, in that understanding. Like once you do that, then you start to bring in leaders from across the nation to really speak their truth and what's happening locally in their communities. And you know, our leaders need to hear from you know the communities themselves and provide you know our leaders with advice on what it is that I need from you to be fruitful and productive in my community. And so I think I think it starts there, educating um, our leaders. Add to what Peter said, and I, I, I agree completely. Um, one of the things that I did several years ago, and Erica, this is when you and I met, when I uh, created a technology internship program, we partnered with Georgia Tech for the first cohort to build out the model, and then it was open to everybody. And, and then we added the high school uh, technology internship program partnering with, with TAG. What I saw from that experience was uh, there, there, there was this, um, and, and I don't think it was intentional, but, what, but from the lens that I, my lens, right, my perspective, I saw that um, African-American females that were in the pipeline uh, most times were not selected for, for various reasons. And and seeing that, what I felt like there needed to be some kind of intervention, right? And so this is where I think companies um, generally drop the ball. They have great window dressing, if you will, for diversity, equity, and inclusion. But then when it comes to actually engaging with the different candidates, bringing people into the organization, um, that's where it kind of gets muddy for a lot of people. And so I think we have to do a better job of now that we have the window dressing and you know it's all beautiful and we have the words uh and the pictures now let's really do the work right so the other part of that is how are we when, when we see things like that what are the interventions that we're implementing to help bring those people along who may not um have that sponsor or that mentor to help them understand how to navigate the different challenges around getting into technical roles. And then for the people that are in the technical roles, what are we further doing to support them and building up their technical leadership? And so I think there's a lot of work there that's still left to be done, but I'm very hopeful that we have now come to a place where everybody recognizes the importance of that and that we're actually going to do something about it. For Amanda or Napia, before you respond, I'd want to just jump in as someone who, you know, previously worked at an organization called IT Senior Management Forum, which specifically focused on Black technology executives. And we would have conversations with these corporations who, Stacey, to your point, right, there was a lot of energy around recruitment and hiring practices. Um, but we had to help them kind of get centered around the reality of that is that what you're really creating is a revolving door if you are not focused on the culture that exists in the organization. It is not just about finding and recruiting and bringing in the talent. It is absolutely a part of the process to ensure that culturally you are empowering and you, you're creating and you're empowering the right environment for everyone to succeed in that environment. Um, so that may mean doing a little shape shifting, right? That may mean having to create some paradigm shifts in, in order to enable that to happen, to happen in a corporate environment. And to your point, you know, for both of you, Peter Gay and Stacey, I mean, yes, we, we see great examples like of your two organizations where movement is happening. Um, but I think we still, if I'm, you know, if I'm being honest and keeping it 100, I think there's still a lot of opportunity for that movement to happen to the level in which it needs to, 
Um, and that's why I'm, I'm really excited that, that, you know, Leanne and Co. and Brian included this conversation as a part of the overall summit. So this dialogue could be in play. Okay, Amanda and Napia, I'm so sorry. I just had to get that off my chest and put that out there, but let's continue the conversation. Please share your thoughts on this. I'm happy to jump in quickly. I think everything Peter Gay and Stacey were um, talking about just with the corporate aspect of things makes me think about our alumni age programming. So we do serve girls in high school and into college. Uh, and this past year, we hosted our first hiring summit to bridge that gap between corporate entities and our girls. Because really, again, going back to our conversation earlier, we saw that COVID extremely impacted the access to opportunities, whether that be conferences or networking spaces in person this year with everything being virtual. And really we were trying to require our corporate partners who are so interested in diversity recruitment to almost commit to a certain number of hired girls at the end of the summit. Um, it didn't exactly play that way, but it was definitely a topic of conversation for them to be able to meet this talent and to meet our pipeline of college age girls, we really do need to ensure that students have access to these opportunities and aren't coming in with the false hope of ultimately securing an internship or an entry level job. So I think the conversation, as we've mentioned, there's not necessarily one solution, but it just goes back to us remembering that we need to build partnerships and have these open conversations, ultimately to ensure girls are served equitably and have the access that they need. So um, ultimately it was a wonderful event. We had over a thousand girls participate and over 50 different corporations join us. So we've seen tremendous numbers with girls actually getting hired, but again, it was going back to that, can you commit to X number of roles or positions? Because that's what's going to guarantee safety for girls and make sure that they are being leveraged for these opportunities. Um, and then piggybacking off of what Amanda said, speaking to the partnerships with, with corporations, I think the biggest thing um, just from a nonprofit standpoint is corporations coming to community organizations and nonprofits and knowing what they want to do. Um, a lot of times uh, from my experience, we get a lot of corporations that will reach out and say, we want to help, we want to throw dollars, but it's not helpful to organizations where we still have to put in 100% of the work. Um, I would, I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with a fellow nonprofit and it's just like, we don't want double the work just for the money. It's more so, or I'm sorry, corporations coming to us and saying, hey, we have a um, curriculum already built out for you. We have a pipeline where all you have to do is train the girls, we'll present whatever that internship is to them, you know, already the skills in place, things like that. But I think the biggest thing is that a lot of the burden is not being put on the nonprofits to produce so much, but also the collaboration that is coming from the corporations as well. Thank you all for talking about something that everything everyone can do, right? You you laid out some phenomenal call to action um, uh, that for the variety of participants that we have in this conversation. So I thank you for that because again, it takes all of us to to, to play our role and to and to be champions and change agents during this time. Um, and we want to thank you for the questions that you all have begun putting in the chat. So we want to raise up some of these questions. And uh, so please know my goal is to start at the top of the list and work our way down just in fairness to how they've been positioned in the chat. So the, the first question that we received from uh, Tamara Pearson, who I want to acknowledge, she uh, serves as a STEM director over at Spelman for um, an, a, an amazing program that she's been given responsibility for there in, in, a, in an, another inaugural role and opportunity. And her question, right, she wants to know, um, how are you disrupting, right, in your particular ways and entities and, and resources, how are you disrupting the unique intersectional challenges of girls and women of color? 
anybody can feel welcome to respond. I can I can start. Um, so thank you for that question, Tamara. So um, for the last few years, as uh, Turner, which we've recently transitioned to Warner Media, we have a community of women called um, Ladies in Tech, and this community has been phenomenal because not only does it touch the women in technology, but it's also those women outside of technology that are looking to be career switchers. And so it's provided a great support structure uh, where we can talk about things that are challenging for us as women and as African-American women, but then also how do we pull those women along who have the aptitude, have the interest, but don't know how to engage in starting a career journey uh, in technology. And so that has been very strategic for us uh, internally into the organization. Um, the partnerships that we've had also with Technology Association of Georgia, partnering with them for a lot of the technology internship program offerings, Girls Who Code, we do a summer camp every summer. So there's a lot of um, uh, ways that we've engaged with the community in, in, in building uh, a, a pipeline and fostering a community environment in technology, I think that what needs to now happen is how do we further that, right? Because, you know, as, as we know, companies, when you start to get to the top, from mid-level to the top, there's where the gaps are for having uh, women and African-American women in leadership roles in technology. So I feel like that's the next uh, work that needs to be done in order to start to make a difference from all of the work that we've invested over the last several years. Yeah. Uh Plus one, I, and, I, and I want to talk about, so at Google, we have a ton of programs, initiatives and work that we sponsor, but uh, there has to be some work done before that in order to get to these programs and these initiatives. And I think one of the, I, I guess, challenges, but also opportunities of working at a tech company is that everything, every business justification has to be grounded in data, right? And so we've, we've done a lot of work over the years at, at looking at those intersections, right, you know, and we, we find that Black women specifically are always at the bottom and have the greatest risk of these issues. And so when you're able to capture that and present that, I think it, being able to provide and show that data is super important. So one last thought. Uh, go ahead, Amanda. Nope, I saw you come off mute. Go ahead, please. <laughs> I can't sit in silence as a former teacher, just isn't in me. But um, I think for us, it's really about providing free opportunities for teachers and students. So we do start supporting students in third grade and work all the way through college. Um, our free resources are just one piece of the puzzle to offering more opportunities for girls. But um, we do rely on the community's volunteers and teachers to really get these programs running. So we give you the curriculum and the activities, the women in tech spotlights, and then have you run a club at your own location. I know that we're going question by question and someone was asking about the pandemic specifically. So we've ensured that the resources are now able for uh, virtual clubs, if you'd like to do that, or if schools are still virtual where you are. So it's really just a matter of getting people materials that they can turn key and use right away. And ultimately re resources that we've researched and have tremendous impact too for students. The Next It Girl has definitely been representation for us. Um, like I mentioned before, all of our programs or workshops have been a variety of computer science and information technology skills. So we're bringing on representation from um, a interest level, a race and gender level, a representation of each of the young girls that are a part of our organization. So being able to see, you know, Stacy or PETA in, you know, an infrastructure role or a developer role, I think that is the biggest way for more interest for our girls of color to be able to pursue tech technology careers. Thank you all. And, and I do want to piggyback on actually Amanda's response because she called it out. The question that is that was the next question sitting over here in the chat where Chelsea, uh, she asked um, if, if, if you all could describe right um, what changes 
you've made to your programs this year uh, to, to be more equitable, um, to, to more equitably support and engage more girls in your programs and organizations. So again, the recognition of the impact, right? Um, the, the recognition of the disruption. And, you know, sometimes people get caught up in, in the disruption versus the recognition of perhaps the uptick that the disruption created. Um, and, and, and a lot of times that can be the change that it invokes, right? So if any of you are um, have, have identified you know, intentional changes that you've made as a result of this disruption um, to create more equitable support. I'm going to give you an example, right? Again, giving you time to noodle on it. Um, during COVID, right, there was a huge recognition of the technology divide, and not just from a laptop perspective, but from an internet connectivity perspective. So even in providing remote services, if families didn't have remote access, um, it was still problematic. Um, so, you know, so let's think about that. Were there any changes that you were able to make um, as you just began to see, you know, notice and see things unfold um, over this past year? Chelsea, thanks so much for your question. Yes, Chelsea, great question. Um, for our organization, we moved all of our programming to the weekends to account for students who may have to support siblings um, after school during work hours for their parents. And then also we help them um, give them all the materials that we need. We mail them directly to them. In the past, we've had uh, camp pickups where parents or students would come make, uh, meet us at a central location and we would give out camp supplies. Um, but the last year when, during the pandemic, we mailed everything to them. We made it as convenient as possible where it was you know, no touch, um, zero interaction with them physically, but we were able to provide everything uh, to them via shipping wise. So definitely moved all of our programming to Saturday mornings, make it more um, available to students who have, you know, busy weeks and then definitely providing all of their resources to them. Yeah, plus one. Um, I, I, I've had the pleasure of working with Chelsea. So thank you for that question. Chelsea is a male <laughs> and um, we work very closely together. I think what Chelsea is pointing to is, is, is also some of the cultural norms of and responsibilities that are placed on our young girls. You know, I think with the pandemic, as he rightfully noted, you know, they've had to take care of their siblings. They've had to take on a lot of those additional responsibilities. And I think one of the things we've had to do is really invite the families into our programs, you know, bring them into these family virtual sessions. And so they can see what the young girls are working on and building. Um, and so th the parents also can help to make space for our young girls to participate and, and so that they don't feel overwhelmed with all of the opportunity, all the things that they responsibilities that they have to be a part of. So at, um, at Girls Who Code, we've seen that partner. Uh, parents are exceptional partners, excuse me. So we made Girls Who Code at home resources. Traditionally, we only had our clubs program where you had to sign up and create an account. And that was a barrier because schools were closed. So we just created weekly activity sets that anyone could go and download. And there was new coding activities every single week. Um, and we saw a lot of parents um, and caregivers be really grateful just to have some activity to do with uh, students, especially in the beginning when schools were still pivoting and trying to figure out how to create a full day's worth of curriculum for students. Um, in addition, uh, Erica, you did mention there was and still is an internet divide for students. So for our summer program um, that Stacy's corporation actually helps support, we do provide internet access to students if they are unable to have that as well as a laptop so that there are no barriers to entry and the program is free. We really just want to ensure that we're being equitable and supporting all students. Thank you, Amanda. I just wanted to add that um, Warner Media is owned by AT&T, and I know that AT&T was one of the leaders in helping to provide connectivity for a lot of students that couldn't access um, the internet. And I'm not corporate responsi uh, social responsibility, but I do know that there are over 1,700 nonprofit organizations that we partner with, and there's also been an expansion for investing in uh, minority content developers. 
um, and, and also, you know, making sure there's that representation in front of the camera as well as behind the camera. So from a corporation perspective, I know there's a lot of effort that has been going on uh, in those spaces. Wow, and I know one of the big words that we kind of got tired of in 2020 was pivot, but I, I thank you for articulating, right, the pivot that happened for your respective organizations and, and for answering Chelsea's question. Um, so now we have a great question here from Eric, um, uh, who is a phenomenal uh, STEM leader in, in the Atlanta metro community and uh, with you know, with, with organizations like Science ATL and um, just an outstanding uh, leader. And he's asking a perfect question, right? Because we don't know everybody that's in the audience, but we know that they, he, he is not alone in wanting to understand this. So his question, what are some things that male leaders in STEM and STEM education may, can do, you know, that, that they could be doing and that they should be aware of? Um, just individually as, as male leaders in this space, and even specifically for fathers of, of, of young women. Um, so any recommendations, uh, ladies, that you have that can empower the men who also want to serve as champions and change agents in this space? I find at Girls Who Code, we are constantly asked this question um, and it's really, first of all, just so encouraging to see that you want to be an ally, Eric, for your daughter or for your female students. I think it's just a matter of um, educating yourself. And we talked about that a little bit earlier about understanding the problem at hand and knowing what resources are available to you. And really just being an encouragement and support to your daughter. Um, we know that this space is difficult to be in. Um, STEM is really competitive and there are a lot of fears associated with STEM for girls. So although I'm not a computer scientist myself and I don't have a computer science background, I know others on this panel could speak to that in their journey or experience, but I think encouragement is always ultimately the best um, advice I can give and understanding how you can support your girl or what she's interested in and making sure that you take every step of the way to get them there. We love allies. Um, we'll start, we start there, especially ones that are, are rooting for us and putting us in uh, positions for us to win in front of corporations that, you know, sometimes don't listen to, listen to women's voices um, at the end of the day. Uh, I think just like like Amanda said, being a support system, um, last year we realized just through our application process of our programs that a lot of the applications were from single fathers who didn't know how to find organizations or find uh, STEM, STEM organizations for their children. So I think it's also being a supporter for other fathers. So if you know other single fathers or fathers trying to get their daughters involved in things, and it just doesn't have to be around STEM, but um, it's all about exposure, you know, just sending a reference or something that your daughter has may, uh, may have attended or a school or another organization. I think that's the best way to get the conversation going, um, but definitely being a, a supporter of the organization, if it's women, girls of color, or um, just minority focused. Yeah, this is, I love this question. Um, a few years ago, I launched an after school program for about 20, about 30 students. And we had a really good gender split and the program was from four to 6 p.m. And what happened was all of the, the parents of the girls didn't want them participating in the program because they were afraid by the time they left the program, it'll be too dark and they would have to travel alone on the trains. And we had this amazing teacher who volunteered to escort the girls home from the program, every day from the program. So to me, I think that's an example of how male leaders can step up just by showing up and participating and being present. You know, in our in our panel prep conversation, we, we talked about um, the imposter syndrome and um, because it's something that's very prevalent for for unfortunately, uh, it's still it's still a very prevalent occurrence 
for women, uh, for women of color, um, being in spaces where uh, they, the feeling is, I don't belong here. I'm not supposed to be here. Um, um, this wasn't a space that was designed for me to be here. Um, so Eric, I think another response to your question or even the, uh, the follow-up question that you put out here around things that, you know, that we should stop doing. Um, one, you know, a lot of times people will dismiss that that is a very real feeling versus acknowledging the feeling and that, and, and, and the root of that feeling. Um, and so for any of us, male or female, when we encounter young women, um, or, you know, both from a, 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 a K through 12 space or definitely, uh, you know, entering in these career opportunities when we see it and we recognize it for someone to help them through it, help them transition past it. Um, because the unfortunate um, scenario is that might not be the only time frame and period in their life where they may feel that. And depending upon, the, we've talked about culture depending upon the cultures that they land in um, and, and the people that they are surrounded by, who quite honestly may be the reason for the invoking of that feeling, right? Um, so anything that, that, you know, there's been great dialogue here around just kind of uplift, the word encouragement, all of that absolutely helps to mitigate the challenges of those feelings and what they present. And the other aspect I wanna share here is as a mother of two sons, one of the things that I really try to encourage with two teenage sons, 18 and 16, for quite a few years, I have tried to focus and encourage them to see the, the young women that they engage with as their equals, ensuring that they are honoring them, giving them the respect, um, giving them you know, the, the acknowledgement um, that they deserve in, in the spaces and places in which they travel. Um, so it's one of those things that we have to be intentional about it, right? And it has to be, we have to have consistency with it. Um, and, and, and again, Eric, great question relative to, you know, a recognition of obviously that young student is not going to see you as someone that looks like them, but they can see you as a champion. They can see you as, as an ally, as the Nepia referenced, right? Um, they can see you as quite honest, we talked about the word sponsorship, standing and being in places where they may not yet be able to go and making sure that the other people that you're engaging with, right? The other people that we're engaging with are not, um, are not falling into the space of, again, invoking those types of feelings for, for these young women. So, um, and, and again, there's, it's not too early to start that. Again, as a mom of two sons, it's never too early uh, to ensure that we're doing what we can do to plant the right seeds. Okay, we have one more question. We have one time for like one more question um, or maybe a couple more. But Jim, okay, Jim Hook um, asked, uh, gave the backdrop. We have placed women and students of color in internships where they have experienced trauma based on their identities. We are now articulating the expectations of a supportive environment in our agreements. How can we take this further? So before our panelists respond, I do wanna just, Jim, I wanna give you an organization to reach out to that can give some, in addition to these amazing panelists, they've been doing this for 50 years. It's an organization called En-ROADS. Um, I'm an alumna of that organization. Um, I'm still now, 30 years later, a champion of that organization. Um, and they are an organization that has specifically focused on um, placing minority students in internship experiences. And over 40% of their students um, are, are focused on STEM career pathways. So I want you to look them up. Um, they do have a, a local office and oh, by the way, Forrest Harper, the president and CEO is also, I'm saying local, I'm sorry, I'm assuming you're in the Atlanta area, my bad for that. Um, they, they, uh, they, they, he is in the Atlanta office, but they have offices all around the country. Um, but because they have established best practices, because they've been doing this for 50 years, um, because they know the challenges that exist, um, and, and none of this dialogue is new dialogue for them. I just wanted to give them a plug um, because they continue to be a change agent in this space um, and have phenomenal fruit 
as a result of that. Okay, ladies, let me hush and let you do what you're supposed to do and let me get back to doing what I'm supposed to do, which is just moderate. Uh, but Jim, thank you for that question. Anybody, Stacy, you came off mute, so please. So I'm raising my hand, Jim, thank you for this question. This is something that's near and dear to my heart. People may have missed this, but last year, AT&T did what they called the Summer Learning Academy in June. They had a internship online, if you will. I believe they called it an externship. But they knew that a lot of students were, uh, the, the internships became canceled because of the pandemic. And so there were thousands of students out there who had internships, no longer had internships. Long story short, they did a program called the Summer Learning Academy where they had almost 50,000 students that registered. They had 30,000 students that were active in the program and they had about 11,000 students that completed the program. And so me studying MOOCs over the last couple of years, I realized the model that they had created that, that was just amazing to me because it, it had never been done this way before. And so I'm actually using that as my uh, dissertation focus. But I said that to say what they did and what I think people miss and don't realize about this is it really brought students into the organization in a different way to learn about the technology that the company is using, to learn about the culture, to create uh, connections, right? The social access with executives and with employees. And when you think about it too, with a massive open online course, there is no application. There is no qualification for getting access to these resources. And so this is what excites me about the future of internships, because I think it's that type of model that we should be using to give more access to students, to get the kind of insights that they need. But on the back end of that, now this turns into a recruitment model for companies, right? They now have the ability to understand who's in their pipeline, where they're from, and if they want to be laser focused on African-American women in technology roles, they can actually design a program for that using this model. And so for me, I'm excited because I think that it, it's just endless possibilities for how we can really change uh, this landscape that we're currently in. Yeah, I think I have two thoughts. The first is, I think companies need to do a better job at creating internship programs without educating the folks who are sponsoring them. You know, because then you cause harm to these young women that are participating in, in the program. And it's happened time and time again. You see it all the time. I think the, the other side to this is as, as someone who has gone through these internships and been the only woman, the only person of color, the youngest, you know, I wish prior to going into these spaces that I've been oriented and had education on what it's like and what to expect. Um, and then some support from mentors to help build up some resiliency to, 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 to these environments. And I think I've had to learn that over time. Um, and uh, it does cause trauma, you know, as you move on and you move on and you, you're constantly on the receiving end of, of a lot of this. So I think you know, education before you offer these programs to young women of color, but also on the flip side, for us as women of color to work together and help each other build up that resiliency. I want to um, piggyback off of PA, um, and I've been in that same position with those internships as well, only woman, youngest. Um, and I think that's where the importance of grassroots organizations come in, local community organizations like the Next Hit Girl and similar organizations where they're surrounded around that community. They're getting advice in that training of what a healthy and safe environment is like prior to going into those internships um, so that they are aware of things to look out for. So they're, um, you know, more spoken and able to, to put that out into the atmosphere of what diversity and inclusion really looks like for each organization. So I think how we can take that further is definitely making sure our girls are in grassroots organizations during middle school, high school, and then ultimately when they get in college, they're more prepared for those internships. I would just add on that um, collectively making a space to have the conversations is so important. So definitely Napia, when that can happen with an organization and students have a strong connection um, and support system there, 
And when that isn't always the case, even for teachers um, and other community leaders to just step in and make a space and a conversation, uh, we rely heavily on guidance counselors, but know that there are always limited resources with them as well. So really just calling to action for schools to have and address these problems that exist uh, and making sure that Again, there's awareness going into it so that girls are prepared. I mean, thank you all for your responses. And, you know, um, we talked earlier around the entire ecosystem playing a role, right? Um, so, you know, another, another source to think of is to identify what are those organizations that are in your specific community um, that uh, may be able to come alongside you as you're creating these internship experiences, right? And immediately provide a support network. A lot of what I've encouraged other women to, to seek out, and it, and it doesn't matter where they are in their career, as someone who graduated from Georgia Tech in 96, I still have incidents that happen in my career trajectory where I'm having to manage <laughs> to a mindset um, and manage to an environment. I've just had the blessing of 30 years uh, to, you know, or 25 years, sorry, to, to be able, well, I was saying 30 because it started back at tech when I had a professor who told me that black women had no business in engineering. Um, so this, this, this is very real, right? That was 1993, that wasn't 67, you know, or 52. Um, that was 1993, um, and ever since then. Um, and one of the one of the things that I that I realized for myself, one in that moment, and have continued to um, to hold myself to, and to encourage others to hold themselves to, are who are other people, men or women, that I can have in my circle as a support network so as you're as it, it you know it's one thing to have the realization right I, I commend you for even recognizing that the experience what it was what it was for your students uh because again some folks can be dismissive to that um and 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 then deciding being intentional to create a better opportunity or to mitigate the same experience or to identify how do we create a, a better safe and, and supportive environment going forward. That takes intentionality. So I applaud you for that. And we have two minutes left. Oh my gosh. Um, or maybe, maybe not even two minutes. Um, so real quick, ladies, 30 seconds, your call to action to this group. Um, phenomenal conversation in the chat, but what's your 30 seconds worth of call to action that you want to make sure people have before they leave this session? Uh, okay, I'll call. I'll call out. Napia, I'm gonna start with you. I'm sorry, you got first pick, but you got. But I'm, caught, I'm starting with. You. It's fine. My call to action um, is definitely be more of a resource support system to nonprofits. Um, we need funding to be able to pr produce these grassroots programs in our communities. We're local to K through 12 education systems, so be resourceful. Um, it doesn't always have to be monetary funds, but being able to be um, an ally for us in, in areas where we need more um, presence, especially representation of Black women, African-American women, and girls of color. Um, I would say my call to action is for you to definitely investigate what resources are there for you, like Napia's organization and many others. Um, girls Who Code has lots of free resources, so continue to uplift and encourage your girls. Yeah, my call to action would be to build community. You'd be surprised at how many like-minded folks are within your network that are interested in doing the same things. And there's so much you can learn from each other and be supportive of each other in that space. My call to action would be, we've noticed that there has been a lot of firsts in the last recent years, um, especially in 2020. Uh, and for me, that's inspiring because it doesn't take a lot to make a difference, right? And so if you're the first at something, um, I think you're being a role model and you're setting the expectation for others around you. And so that's something I'm exploring right now. Like, what can I do with my resources from, from networks to 
um, just, you know, my own uh, giving. But at the same time, if I'm the first, then that's great because you're setting a, a standard for, you know, what you expect from others. So I would say, you know, look where you can be the first to help make a difference. Standing ladies, thank you so much for your time and your commitment to this conversation um, and for all the things that you're doing individually and through your organizations in the community. And to the participants, thank you so much for being here. We're honored by your presence and that you made the choice to be a part of this conversation and this discussion. And thank you for being such active participants in the conversation. Have a blessed day and we're all gonna do our part to move things forward. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.